All right, our new uh, faith promise total is now 82,000. We're getting there. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll continue to do that throughout the month. So turn with me, if you would, please, this morning to 2 Peter. <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 3. I'd like to read for you the first seven verses of that chapter. And you can follow with me in your Bible, please, as I read those verses. 2 Peter <clears throat> chapter 3. I'll begin reading at verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the waters and in the waters, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men." Let's bow, please, for a word of prayer. Father, how we thank you and praise you today for your great love and mercy that you've shown us by sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. And Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for loving us enough to come and to take on human flesh and to be born of a virgin and to willingly lay down your life on Calvary's cross and shed there your precious sinless blood to pay for our sins to die in our place, to be buried in our tomb, and then to rise again from the dead for our salvation. We thank you that it's full and free by grace through faith in Christ. We thank you, Holy Spirit of God, for being willing to come and indwell every believer and seal us until the day of redemption, to give us power and grace and to enable us as we live in this earth to live for the Lord Jesus. And then I thank you for this place. I thank you for everyone who's come out. I thank you for everyone who's watching and everyone who's listening. I thank you, Lord, for the word of God and pray that as we look into it by your Holy Spirit, you'd open the lips of your servant to speak and the heart of every person to receive the word of God. And I pray that you'd accomplish your will and do what is in your heart to do here in this place. Guide us and direct us now, my Father. We'll thank you, praise you, and give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Throughout the scripture, there is a mention of a point and period in time in human history called the last days or the end times. The word of God also gives a pretty careful description of what those days will be like and what the philosophical and social and educational and political and religious characteristics of those days will be. I think I feel a series coming on. <laughs> However, the message that I want to bring this morning is only one part of such. In our text passage, though a description of the last days continues on beyond our text verses for today, what I want to look at is quite different. Before we look at the main body of my message this morning, I want to bring a few things to your attention. We have in these verses two contrasting worldviews. In verse 1, we have the worldview of those who have pure minds. Now that word pure in the Greek is the word elikrenes. It means judged by sunlight. It means genuine, it means sincere. Sir, there are those who are called the brethren, speaking about those who are born again Christians, those who know Christ as Savior, who the Bible calls those who have pure minds or minds that can be judged in the sunlight. You know what that's descriptive of, isn't it? You know, you can see much more in the light than you can see in the darkness. And so it's talking about minds who have been enlightened by the Son of God. It's talking about people who are sincere and genuine. But then in verse 5, we have the worldview of those who the Bible calls the willingly ignorant. Look what it says. For this they willingly are ignorant of. 
Now the word ignorant is the word lanthano. It means unaware. And the word willingly is the word fellow, which means to choose or to intend. And so these are those who have a world view who choose to be unaware of certain things. These are the people who have a world view who intend not to know certain things. In other words, don't tell me, I don't want to know. Then the other people are the ones that say, tell me, I want to know. I want to know the truth. Now that word willingly ignorant means to choose not to know, but I kind of like the term willingly ignorant. (laughs) That old King James Bible is pretty good, isn't it? So the Holy Spirit is writing to the genuinely enlightened and sincere about the willingly ignorant or those who choose not to know. Not to know what? Not to know truth. In verse 3 we find a characteristic of these who are willingly ignorant. Now I want you to keep in mind that willingly ignorant does not mean stupid. It does not mean unlearned and it does not mean uneducated. You can be very educated, but willingly ignorant. You can be very uh, intelligent, but willingly ignorant. It can often be quite the opposite of being uh, dumb. The problem is the truth of 2 Timothy 3.7, where the Bible says, ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so there are people that go to college and 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 and they come out with more degrees than they have hair on their head. And they're willingly ignorant of something that some of our sixth graders know in Sunday school. Why? Because the Bible says they're ever learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Why? Because they are willingly ignorant. They choose not to know the truth. They can be very educated and sophisticated. But verse 3 says they're walking after their own lusts. Look at verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, and it says about them, not only are they willingly ignorant like verse 5, but it says they walk after their own lusts. Now the word lusts here means desires. They are only concerned about their own preconceived agenda. And according to verse 4, they practice derision politics or derisional tactics. Look at verse 4. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? Do you see the chiding in the voice? Can you hear the, the, uh, the attitude? Well, where is the promise of his coming? I thought Jesus was coming. See? Well, I know he is. But, <laughs> but these people here are saying, well, 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 you know. So they ignore the truth and they rely upon bullying, name-calling, deriding, and the childish tactic of talking louder than you. Find anybody you've ever seen or heard? They do not want to debate the facts because they do not want any other conclusion than the one they've already formed. Therefore, they are insincere minds who do not want the truth to be as it is, but as they want the truth to be. The Bible says of these people in Romans chapter 1 verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They congratulate themselves and they award themselves and they promote themselves while being willingly ignorant and at the same time claiming to be searching for the truth. Newsflash. Fake news. That's what verse 4 is. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's false news. Because the true news is in verse 5 and 6. 
The false news, the fake news in verse 4, listen, I want you to know this. Fake news is old news. You got it? Fake news is old news. There has been fake news since the Garden of Eden. Satan was the one who came up with the first fake news. When he said to Adam, newsflash Adam, ye shall not surely die. And Adam believed fake news instead of the truth. And it's happening right on down through history right to today, isn't it? So the media think they have this big thing called fake news. It's been going on since the Garden of Eden. Wherever there's been the truth, there's always been a lie. See, the real news, the fake news is that all things are the same since the beginning. But the real news is, no, there was a worldwide flood. Look at verse 6. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. This world hasn't been the same. It had a worldwide flood. But see, they want to be willingly ignorant of that. Why? Because that's God's word. So the people in verse 6, 5, who are willingly ignorant, are willingly ignorant of the word of God. Now, Al Gore published a book a while back entitled, An Inconvenient Truth. And I believe it's a book uh, about the warming, uh, the propaganda of uh, global warming. But for those who are willingly ignorant, the real inconvenient truth is the Bible. Isn't it? The Bible's inconvenient truth to a large portion of humanity. Therefore, we are on the, they are on the wrong side of all the issues. Look, if you're going to be willingly ignorant of this book, then you're going to be on the wrong side of all the issues. See, they're willingly ignorant of the truth, so they're on the wrong side of the abortion issue. They're willingly ignorant of the truth, so they're on the wrong side of the gender issue. They're, they're willingly ignorant of the truth, so they're on the wrong side of um, just about any issue that has anything to do with morality. They're willingly ignorant. And this verse tells us they're willingly ignorant, therefore they're on the wrong side of the evolution issue, aren't they? When we, we ask ourselves, we say, why don't they see it? Why are they on the wrong side of these issues? Because they are willingly ignorant of the truth of the Word of God. How does this happen? Well, I will attempt to answer that by looking at a word that we find in verse 6. We're going to do a little word study here on one word. We're going to look at this word. And it is the word world. Look at verse 6. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now this word word, this word world right here in verse 6 is talking about the created world of verse 5. Look over, if you would, in Hebrews chapter 1. If you can get there, Hebrews chapter 1. I want you to look at verse 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he, what? Made the worlds. The worlds were made. They were made by God. More specifically, this verse says they were made by the Son of God, Jesus Christ. This is referring to the natural, physical world around us. It's talking about our planet, our solar system, the entire universe. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, the Bible says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Amen. I want you to remember that. The worlds were framed, how? By the word, word by the what? 
by the word, by the what? Word. By the word of God. So why can't the willingly ignorant get it? Because they choose not to get it. Because we have to know it by what? By faith. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 again. The worlds were framed. That means they were made. That word means created. It means framed. Now go to John chapter 1. Bear with me now. Go to John chapter 1. I want you to see this. John chapter 1. Now Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 told us that the worlds were framed by the word, word. word of God. Right? Look at John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. Here it is, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The Him of verse 3 is the Word of verse 1. All right, now, go over to verse 14. And the what? Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so what do we have? We have the writer of Hebrews saying the, words were, the world was framed by the Word of God. Then we have John saying the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. Who's that? That's Jesus Christ. It says, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. There it is. There's the Son. So Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's God the Son. He's the Word. He's the one who framed and created the worlds. The Lord Jesus Christ is the creator of the worlds. Every planet, every star, every meteorite, and every speck of dust on a speck of dust was created by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, way, way back. Genesis chapter 1. I want to show you the Big Bang. <laughs> the Big Bang is in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now look at verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And what? There was light. There was light. Bang! <laughs> God said, light! <laughs> and there was light. Look over at verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament. Bang! There it was. Oh yeah, there was Big Bang. But God was the one who made the bang. God created the world and the surrounding universe, and it belongs to Him. It is His. He created it out of nothing with the help of no one. Psalm 89, 11 says, The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. And God himself, he says to kings and to conquerors, he says to presidents and to peasants in Psalm 50, verse 12, If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. God said, if it were possible for me to be hungry, why would I ask you? I have a universe to pick from. Evolution is fake news. Yes, it is. Number two. That word there meant the created world, but I want you to go to, and you know this verse, but if you don't, if you'd like to turn to it with me, go to John 3.16. John 3.16, of course, is for God so loved the world. world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. The word world in John 3.16 refers to a specific segment of the created world. And that specific segment is mankind. Mankind is God's crowning creation. But of course, the word mankind is now considered offensive and sexist language. I don't know if you're keeping up on that, but that's the new attack now. Uh, uh, you can't use the word mankind because it's sexist, discriminatory. Matter of fact, there was a, I just saw a news article where a young lady in college, uh, her, she got a deduction from her paper because she used the word mankind. And her professor said, that's sexist language, we can't use that. So maybe, maybe we should say, instead of mankind, we could say humanity. Oh! Can't say humanity, because right in the middle of humanity is man. Is man. See where we've come? But this is also the willing ignorance. Because God created man. Out of the ground and then he created woman out of man so woman was created by God after the same kind as so she is mankind she's a kind of man but she ain't a man praise God amen man if God would have made another me That would have been judgment, not mercy. Amen? <laughs> you see, God created solar systems and galaxies, but they weren't like Him. God created trees and seashores and mountains, but they weren't like Him. God created birds and fish and beasts and creeping things, but they weren't like Him. God created angelic beings and heavenly beasts, but they weren't like Him. So God created man in His own image. Male and female created he them, and they were like him. Of all the other creatures that God made, he called them living things. But of man, he said, a living soul. Mankind is the only created order of which it is said that God loved them, and God died for them and preparing an eternal place for them. Amen. In Hebrews 2.16, the Bible says, for, the, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Romans 8.3, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. God became a man. He didn't become anything else. This is the world of mankind in John 3.16. The world to which we who are saved have been sent with the gospel of salvation by grace through faith. In the Bible, that's called the good news. Amen? Look, the world may have its fake news. But what the world needs is some good news. And that is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God created the world, but he loved the world or mankind. The, the, the human beings are the creatures to whom are to preach the everlasting gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the world of mankind. So you have the world, the created world. Then you have the world of mankind. Number three, go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Look with me at verse 15. We have the third, the third world. See, there's the created world. There's the world of mankind. Then there's this third world. It's mentioned in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 where the Bible says, Love not the world. Now you'd say, wait a minute. The Bible says God so loved the world, and now he's telling us not to love the world. Yes, this is because it's a third world. It's not the world 
of mankind. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The word world here refers to the operating system of the world of mankind. So you have God who created a world. And then on that world, he created a world of mankind. And then that world of mankind created a world system. A system that ignores God and is willingly ignorant. A system that operates not by faith, but by sight. The Bible-believing Christians, we're to love the world of mankind, but not love mankind's world system. The world system has developed independently of God and it has developed away from God. I can see that in my own lifetime. Can't you? I can see that the world system has gone away from God, not closer to God. The world system, according to the Bible, has a prince, Satan according to John 12, 31. This world system has a God, also Satan, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The world system has children, Luke 16, 8. It has its own wisdom, 1 Corinthians 3, 19. It has its own course, Ephesians 2, 2. It has its own prophets, 1 John 4, 1. It has its own spirit, which is the spirit of disobedience, Ephesians 2, 2. It has its own fashion, Romans 12, 2. It has its own cares, Roman, uh, Matthew 13, 22. It has its own rules, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 and 8. It has its own character, Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. It has its own goods, 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. That's all part of the world system that's operating independently of God. Do you think the 3M Corporation thinks about God every morning? Do you think Xerox cares about what the Bible has to say? No. Why? Because that's the world system. Our education system doesn't even care about God anymore. It used to. It used to. At least it gave lip service. But now our, the world system, moving away from God, says let's take our education system away from God too. Look, we didn't need him for our economic system. We don't need him for our education system. We don't need God for our military system. We don't need God for this and for that. The world system has been developed so mankind could live without God and is designed to bring prosperity, peace, and power without God, but has miserably failed. The world system is temporary. And according to 1 John 2, verse 17, it's going to pass away. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew 13, 40, that there's an end of the world coming. Now, somebody's going to have to be there at the end of the world, right? We might be the ones. I mean, you look around, just look around. If you can't see it, you're just being willingly ignorant. But we may be those who are going to see the end of the world. Jesus said it's coming. And Peter wrote that this world and its system is waiting in store for judgment. Look back at 2 Peter chapter 3 again. Look at verse, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. Let's go there. Look at verse 8. Look at verse, well, let's look at verse 7. It says, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store. That means that, now, who, who framed the world? Who created the worlds? The what? The word. the word. And now this verse is saying that the same word, world, that the word created, that same word, the Lord Jesus, is holding the world together. You understand? So he created it and he keeps it going. It's sort of like 
It's sort of like a bicycle. You get on a bicycle, it doesn't go by itself. You've got to make it go. And when you stop making it go, it don't go. It falls over. God created this, this, this world. He's keeping it going. When he decides he's not keeping it going anymore, guess what? It's not going to go anymore. The Bible says here that this world is being kept in store, reserved under fire against the day of judgment. In other words, we know from the scripture that God promised never to flood the world again, but he did promise to burn it up like a cinder someday. But the world is willingly ignorant. Because what does the world system say? The world system says we're going to do it. The world system says we're going to destroy the planet. That's fake news. The real news is that God is reserving this planet for his judgment and destruction. He created it. He'll destroy it. We can't. You say, well, are you for pollution? No, I'm not for pollution. But I'm not going to be willingly ignorant and think that man is going to destroy his planet with, with global warming. I'm going to tell you what, there's coming a global warming. <laughs> it's going to get so hot, it won't be nothing left. You see, there is the created world. And there is the world of mankind. And then there is the world system. But then there's lastly the fourth world. And it's in John chapter 18. We read about it. John chapter 18. And verse 36. The fourth world. John 18, 36. And it is the spiritual world. John 18, verse 36. Jesus answered. Now pay attention to what he says. My kingdom is not of this world. Ah, boy, that makes a little goosebump go up my neck. Amen? If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Jesus said, my kingdom isn't of this world. This is the world that mankind and its system has chosen to be ignorantly willing, willingly ignorant of. The spiritual world, the kingdom of God. And this willing ignorance has a sinister depth and a specific target. I find it interesting that the same at the same time, uh, alarming the world is so caught up with the things of the supernatural. Do you, do you, you, you see that right now? Everything's supernatural uh, on television, in the movies, uh, uh, everywhere, in the books. It's all supernatural stuff. But they want to be so consumed with the supernatural, but at the same time, they're willingly ignorant of the truth of the supernatural. For some reason, they like, you know, zombies and, and vampires and angels from hell and things like that. But they're not too concerned about the love of God and the love of Jesus and the salvation of mankind. Why? They're willingly ignorant. But that's part of the willing ignorance. It's part of the lie. It's part of the blindness and the derision of the inconvenient truth of the Word of God. Is it not telling that public school systems will, uh, will have classes to study Islam, That's right. but not Christianity? That's right. Is it not chilling that public school systems have the children learn and quote Islamic prayers while it's, in, while it's against the law to pray Christian prayers? I just find that strange. Is it not hypocritical to read the Quran in public schools while banning the Bible? And is it not enlightening that of all the world religions, 
Every single religion in the world except Bible-believing Christianity, because it's not a religion, it's a relationship. But every other religion or faith are works-oriented. Isn't that interesting? Because the world system says man must do, man must achieve, man must accomplish, man must purchase. And yet Jesus said unto them, ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Jesus left no room to believe in anyone else. He left no wiggle room to believe in anything else. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He said, if you don't believe that I am He, that means I am the one, I am the only one. If you don't believe that I am He, you'll die in your sins. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So all, all the other religions of the world are fake news. There's only one gospel, Amen. and it's the gospel of Christ. Amen. There's only one salvation. The Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. That's fake news. There's only one name. It's the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the king of the fourth world. A spiritual kingdom called heaven to which he invites you by his grace to enter by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God created a world on which the world of mankind could live in fellowship with him. But the world of mankind turned away from God and created their own world system to operate independently from God and without God, which world is only temporary because of sin and will one day pass away. But God has provided a way through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who visited the created world and became part of the world of mankind and died, shedding His sinless human blood for our sin, rose again, and now invites all who believe to become part of the fourth world, His world, His kingdom, by faith. Jesus said, except a man be born again, He cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the flesh is born of the world of mankind. And he said, I'm not of this world. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Jesus is saying, you've been born on this world to the world of mankind. But if you want to get to my world, to the fourth world, to heaven, you've got to be born of the Spirit of God to become a child of God. When leaving this world, Jesus made a promise to everyone who would believe on Him. He said this, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Folks, I'm on my way to the fourth world. Are you? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. As we think about the things we've heard this morning from the Word of God. Maybe you're here tonight and you're today and you're a born-again Christian. You know you're saved and you're sure of it. And you're just waiting to get to the kingdom of heaven. Would you raise your hand and say, yes, I'm saved and I'm thankful for it. Praise God. Thank you. Put them down. To you who are saved, Peter penned this. 
Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? God's asking Christians not to live like the willingly ignorant. He's asking us to live like those who see and know and understand. He's asking us to live a life that's godly. Are you living like this world is your permanent home? Have you lost sight of which world you really are of? Or have you been captured by the seen and laboring for the gold that perishes? Maybe this morning, dear Christian, you need to come and get before God and say, oh Lord, I want to get my eyes off this world and get my eyes on Jesus. I'm waiting to one day I'll be in the kingdom of heaven. And I want to live like I'm going there. Maybe you're here this morning, you're watching or listening, you've never been saved, never been born again. Do not allow this world to rob you of the next. Do not remain ignorant and please do not go away without Christ. Because then you will not only be ignorant, but you'll be willingly ignorant. Do not believe the fake news of religion or philosophy, but receive a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Maybe this morning you're here. And you say, preacher, I, I've never heard it put that way, but it sure makes sense to me. And I'd like to ask Jesus to be my savior. I'd like to be born again. And you can be right where you sit. It's just a transaction between you and God, a transaction of faith, where you can call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and trust him alone to forgive your sins and save your soul. You say, preacher, I'd like to do that. i help you. If you'd like to trust Christ as your Savior right where you sit, I'd like you to look up at me and we'll just pray together. Anybody like that here today? All right. Anybody else? Okay. I want you to understand it's not a magic prayer. It's a prayer of faith. And when God sees you pray in your heart, he sees the truth of your prayer and he accepts that as your faith. So why don't you bow your head and just pray something like this to God. Just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner and I know I can't save my own soul, but I believe that Jesus Christ came to earth, became a man, shed his blood on Calvary's cross to pay for my sins, died, was buried and rose again so that I could have salvation. And right now, Lord Jesus, I'm reaching out and asking you for the gift of eternal life by trusting you as my Savior. Please forgive my sins and come into my heart. Save me by your grace and keep me by your power. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. If you prayed that prayer in a minute in your heart, would you look up at me? On the authority of God's word, the Bible said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. On his authority you're saved. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You just became children of God today. You got God's word on that and he cannot lie. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. You have received the gift of eternal life today and on God's authority, you'll never perish. You're going to the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight, today. Lord, you're so kind, so gracious, so merciful, so good. Thank you for doing all this for us and recording it in your word so that we could see it and know it and have it. Thank you for those who got saved today. Encourage their hearts and strengthen them and give them understanding and open their eyes to your truth. And Father, they might behold wonderful things in your word. I pray you'd bless us as we have the invitation. Help us to come, Father, and, and just praise you and thank you. Help us to come and get on our faces and just say, Oh, Lord, I want to live like Jesus is coming. Help us, Lord. We'll give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing our closing hymn. Our closing hymn this morning is what? 664. Let's take our hymn book. 664. If God has kind of spoken to your heart this morning, you'd like to come and get in prayer with the Lord. The altar's open. Maybe you'd like to come and say, Lord, I need to live more like you want me to. 
Maybe you'd like to come and say, Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for keeping me. And thank you that I don't have to be willingly ignorant because I have the Word of God and I can read it and I believe it. I don't know what God's speaking to your heart about, but you come and pray, would you? Maybe you've been listening to some of that fake news and you want to just listen to the good news, the Word of God. All right, we're going to sing. You come now as we sing on the first. Is your life a channel of blessing? Is the love of God flowing through you? Are you telling the lost of the Savior? Are you ready His service to do? Make me a channel of blessing today. Make me a channel of blessing, I pray. My life possessing, my service blessing. Make me a channel of blessing today. All right, here's what we're going to do on this next stanza. If you're here today and, and you got saved, God knows it, I know it, you know it. But you know what? Everybody would like to know it. Because we'd like to rejoice with you. We'd like to give God the glory for you. We'd like to pray for you. Now here's what I'm going to do on this next stanza. If you got saved today, I'd like you to take your courage in both hands. Come up and stand with me. Let's tell everybody. I'll, you don't have to say anything. I'll say it. But you just come. Give God the glory, would you, as we sing on the second. Is your life a channel of blessing? Uh, Are you burning for those who are it's your husband? Lost? It's your boyfriend. What's his name? Gary. Gary and Sue. You and you trust in Christ today. Died on the cross. Make me a channel of blessing today. Make me a channel of you have blessing. I pray. My uncle. My your uncle Gary. Uh, my service blessing. Make me a channel of blessing today. This is Sue and Gary. And Jerry. Gary. Gary. Sorry, Gary. First time I ever met Gary. But Gary became my brother today. Amen. And Sue became my sister because they trusted Christ as their Amen. Savior. And her uncle from Maryland suggested they come today. Amen. We're so glad you came. I want to welcome you to Grace Calvary. We want to welcome you to the family of God. Amen. And now you have eternal life. Um, I'd like I'd like you to go with Brian. Would you go with Brian? He's got some things I'd like to give you. All right, all right, Brian. Why don't you go? All right. We're going to sing that next stanza. What about you? Are you sure you're going to heaven? You know, maybe you came in here unsure, but you can go out absolutely sure. Just like Jerry and Sue, Gary, <laughs> Gary and Sue. Yeah. All right, we're going to sing that next stanza. If you need to be saved, you come and see me. Otherwise, the altar's open. On the last. We can all be channels of blessing If our lives are not known sin We will barriers be and a hindrance To those we are trying to win Make me a channel of blessing Make me a channel of blessing, I pray. My life possessing, my service blessing. Make me a channel of blessing today. Amen. I remember now there was a man that called me this week from Maryland, asked me to go visit his relatives. And um, some things happened yesterday. I didn't get to visit them, but God brought them here. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Amen. God's an awesome God, isn't he? Yes. So you pray for Gary and Sue. <laughs> all right, you all know their names now, amen? <laughs> so you be praying for them, make them feel welcome. And uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, how we love you again. Lord, you just continue to amaze us by your power and by your great grace. Thank you for saving us and thank you for using us so that you can save other people through the gospel. I pray you'd bless Gary and Sue, help them to grow in the wisdom and knowledge of Christ. I hope they found a church home here. And Father, I pray for all of us as we go out of this place that we might be witnesses, carry the gospel, the good news, into a world of fake news, 
so that people can be saved and know the truth. Help us, Father, also to be that light and salt that this world so desperately needs. Guide us and direct us as we go. We'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.